Hello. Hello, good morning. How are you? Well, thank you very much for your attendance to this conference. You know from the CLIC, from the Center for Learning, Innovation and Knowledge, we organize courses specially devoted to train teachers in their professional development. Uh, thanks to the terrific job of uh, Ingrid Sabatea and Monica Bouffil, uh, we are implementing all these seminars, courses, conferences, uh, lectures, etc. Most of you have been uh, part of this uh, program of um, innovation, training, adaptation to teaching into, um, into your current activity in the university. And now we have one of these special lectures we, would, we like to organize in our university. You know, sometimes we call uh, and we invite experts especially from Europe, to talk about timely subjects in teaching, in innovation, in research, uh, and in uh, different subjects related with um, the programs we are working on. At this moment, the university uh, is uh, part of a, a program to think about the link between research and teaching, and uh, we also consider this is a very, very important subject for us. For this reason, we have invited Professor Paul Blackmore from the King's College in London. He's an expert um, in this field. He's an expert in many fields in education. In fact, he belongs to the Policy Institute uh, and uh, his main domain is uh, education and um, also the link between research uh, and teaching, um, how the, ed the education has been implemented in institutions, etc., etc. He received a national um, award uh, on, of teaching, in fact, for, by the British government. And, in fact, you have also um, his curriculum in the invitation to this lecture. I'm going to pass the microphone to, to him. We are waiting for another microphone for, for this session uh, in order to make, it, uh, make the conference a bit easier. But for the moment, we can use this one. We are very glad to have you here. Thank you very much for accepting this invitation. And uh, I'm sure we are going to enjoy your lecture today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manel, and um, good afternoon, and thank you very much for coming along on this sunny afternoon when, uh, or when you probably have many other things you could be doing. Thank you also for dealing with the fact that I cannot speak Spanish, and I feel very inadequate that I cannot speak Spanish, but I, I hope you can cope with my English. Um, as Manel said, I have a, a background in working in, in, in universities. I have worked in... Uh, two in particular that are research intensive institutions and my responsibility has been to improve the quality of teaching in them and that can be a tricky business if people are really more interested in doing research than in doing teaching um, and therefore I took a very particular interest in this because if you can't find answers to the problem that we're looking at here, you can't really persuade people to concentrate on teaching. So what I'm planning to do today... Uh, oh, 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 this, no, 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 let's try and get this right. Yes, that way around. Um, the, I have a plan, so this is to reassure you. There is a plan. It may not be a good plan, but it is a plan. Um, to, to, to look at what we mean by teaching and research, because as soon as you start to think about linking them together, it makes problematic the question of what is teaching and what is research anyway. I want to look at the external changes that mean that universities are having to think harder about what they're doing. I'd like to have a think about learning, which I would suggest unites the two activities. Um, and then think about linking research and teaching. Now the picture on the right there is deliberately chosen. I don't like to say this usually because it tells you about my age, but this computer uh, is 1965. It was actually designed in the late 50s, which has been used there in 1965, and there are people consulting the ticker tape, and of course you have to wear a very old-fashioned suit to do this work. Um, and the interesting thing to me is that I was just coming to the end of primary school when this computer was really hot stuff. It was a good computer. 
it did nothing like as much as your phone does or my phone does. It took a whole room. It had to have special heating and people to look after it. And that's well within my working lifetime because I expect to work for another 10 years possibly. Think now how life is going to change in the next 50 years. That's what we're talking about, a working lifetime. And we can't even begin to imagine. If we tried to imagine, we would be wrong. We don't know what we are preparing ourselves and our citizens for in the future. Makes education quite an interesting topic when we don't know what we're preparing people for. So I thought that was not a bad opening because what we think is really good stuff today, the, the stuff on our, uh, on our phones and on our desks, will just look ridiculous in 10 years' time let alone 50 years' time. So, okay, so that's by way of a start. We, you have a microphone. Should we quickly do that? It will save, sorry. It'll save you looking like a bad person. <laughs> Can you now... Something's happening. Can you now hear me? Is that okay? Back? Right. Thank you very much. That's really, really helpful. Um, okay. So that's what we're going, we're going to do. And I wanted to start with a little bit of a, a story about what I did to try and think about the relationship between research and teaching. I was in a, a university where people would tell me, of course our teaching's brilliant because our research is brilliant. In fact, if you just let us get on with our research and, in fact, give us some more money for research automatically our teaching will get better. It's simple. Um, and I didn't think it was that simple, really, but there was no evidence one way or the other. And that's typical of universities, as I'll say a bit later, who say that their research informs their teaching, and you ask, how do you know? And there is a big silence, because we just believe it's so. So I asked faculty... And I asked students in quite an organised piece of research to see, well, what was the climate like in the university? How much difference did it make that there was research going on? Here are half a dozen comments, real comments from real students that, that show the range of things that, that real students were saying. This is one I used yesterday. And if you saw the thing that I did yesterday, my apologies. A few of the slides are the same, but the discussion is different, I hope. Um, this is a fairly typical positive one. A student saying, thumbs up, yes, research is good, it's cool. It's cool seeing articles and stuff written by people in the department. I like to know these people are at the top of their game. Of course you would be pleased, wouldn't you? And this one. So you feel that you're actually contributing in some way. Uh, particularly in the humanities and social sciences, people may feel they're contributing to the, the ongoing development of the work. And you could argue that it is possible to do that in the humanities and social sciences, possibly harder in the hard sciences, but possibly harder in mathematics. But So it's different in different parts of the university. You're part of his developing theory. That's nice and warm. We like that. Um, then it goes a little bit less positive. This was a real comment. It was so obvious to him, and we're all sitting there going, I don't know, I don't get it. Um, so there are problems with trying to present research that is at the cutting edge to students, especially if the person teaching has no conception anymore that it's really quite difficult stuff, because it's obvious. It's obvious to them. Here's... Another one, equally problematic, I think. Those involved in research get a bit carried away. Less able to focus on the teaching side. It's very interesting, and this is a damning comment, isn't it? It's not something you can use or discuss. OK, a lot of stuff, but what do I do with it? Yes, he's clearly or she's clearly very interested in it, but how does that help me in the world? which is a perfectly reasonable question. And then, it's the one I used yesterday. I'll give you a second to have a look at that one.
the famous academic, famous by being on television, but actually never present. In the university I went to, there was an old story about Malcolm Bradbury, who was a famous writer who taught creative writing at the university. And the question is, what is the difference between Malcolm Bradbury and God? And the difference is, God is everywhere. Malcolm, Malcolm Bradbury is everywhere, but not here. Um, you can use that joke for anybody. You really transfer that, if you like. But it, 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 there's a kind of an unholy alliance going on there, isn't there? So somebody's got great prestige, is attached to the university. It, it raises the, the, the value of the degree, in a sense, because the university gets more famous. Uh, but it actually doesn't improve the teaching one little bit especially if the academic is not present. And one of the things that students said uh, when you're asked, how do you notice that there is research going on in the university? They say, well, the academics are not there. All right, there's a notice on the door that says, I am available for consultation on Wednesday between 12 and 1. I have seen those notices. Now, how is that helpful to students, really? And, and that is how students often experience research in the university. This is, is a more serious but thoughtful one. I'll give you a second to digest that. This is a student who's being asked to work like a researcher not just sit there listening to a lecture and then another lecture and another lecture. And this is the, the awkward feeling that you get from it. <laughs> it's making me work hard. I'm less comfortable, but very grudgingly, yeah, it seems to be doing me a bit of good, even though it's quite hard work. Now, I think there's a lot of reality in that comment. Quite a lot of the time, research doesn't inform teaching because... It's easiest for the academic just to talk about their research. It's very easy for the student to sit there and take notes. Not much learning has taken place. The student hasn't processed very much at all, but it looks good. Um, it looks as if work has been done, but it might not have been. Now, coming back to that claim that research, good quality research informs teaching, the interesting fact, given that universities are full of really bright people. I mean, that's what they're there for, be full of bright people. Um, and many of them believe that research informs teaching. If you look at the evidence, um, it doesn't seem to. Hattie and Marsh, oh, that's changed in the, uh, in the wash. Um, Hattie and Marsh, in the late 90s, did a study, which is a meta-study, of all the research projects that had tried to see what was the relationship between good quality research and good quality teaching? Could you show that because the research quality was good, in, uh, research quality was good, that the teaching would be better in any way? And the sad answer is, you couldn't. Uh, there's no proven link between the two, especially in the areas where most people automatically say, yes, of course my research informs my teaching. That is in the, the, the natural sciences in research-intensive universities. Very little obvious carryover. Um, where they could find examples were in American liberal arts colleges, much more humanities and social science-based, um, where they could see there was a low carryover, but not very much. So that's slightly problematic. We claim that the m main activity many people do in universities makes a difference to teaching, but... You, you can't seem to be able to prove that that's so. And here's a couple of quotes. Again, my apologies, I used this yesterday, but it's, it, well, I'll move on to something new in a moment. Um, the Boyer Report in the 1990s was a very important point in U.S. higher education development because, as you will know, the higher education system in the United States is, is, is very uh, competitive and it's also very expensive. Um, and the report that came out from the Boyer Commission, and it is available on the web if you just Google Boyer Report, you'll see it is really quite interesting reading, said that 
the Ivy League institutions were being very dishonest about their offer to students. They were claiming that the students would get a distinctive experience, but the professors were off somewhere else, and the students got uh, postgraduate students, which is, which is fine to an extent. Of course, that can be a very productive thing, but it can't be the whole of the student's experience. And so that was a very, very critical report. The second quote that you've got there is just an example of what people said when they came to inspect uh, an institution in the UK, which is essentially that although there's a claim made that research informs teaching, when you tried to dig down, you couldn't see where it did or how it did, and nobody appeared to have got themselves organised for it. So it's an area where there are huge claims, and people get very, very sensitive if you suggest that perhaps their research is not making a difference to teaching. But there's some work to do in this area, I would suggest. Now, um, I think I'm going to go on to a, a question. Right, what I don't want to do is talk to you for two solid hours in a warm room. You will be nearly dead, and so will I. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be really cruel and ask you questions. Um, there's two simple questions there, and I presume everybody's got a piece of paper and a pen. Would you, for yourself, just write down what teaching is and what research is? Two of the harder questions I can think of to ask you, actually. But what is teaching and what is research? And we'll just take a few answers in a bit. Two minutes to do that. OK, let's see where you've got to. It doesn't matter if you haven't finished. Now, clearly, there are no right and wrong answers here because these are words in use in the world and they mean different things in different places. But it would be interesting to see if there is a variety of view um, among, amongst you as a group. Um, so would anybody like to chance their arm and suggest, preferably in English, if you would, um, what teaching is? What teaching is... Please. Can you say that again and very loudly? Okay, giving knowledge and specific tools for learning to students. Fine. Okay, thank you. Do you want to say why you think that's so? Can I unpack that a bit? Right, okay. 
Thank you. I mean, the good start. To me, two words that are important in that, which we'll come to in a minute, are giving and transfer, which is a, an interesting couple of words. Thank, thank you. Anything else? Please. Can you be in the beginning of that again? I missed that. The uh, exchange experience. Exchanging experience. Yeah. yeah. That's different from giving, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, and that's your reason for, for going for that. Exchanging experience in order to... Uh, develop knowledge. Right. Develop knowledge. That's interesting that knowledge has come up twice, that it's principally about the development of knowledge. Okay. Other suggestions? Right at the back. Yes, please. Nice and loudly, if you would. Assuming that students learn something, students teach whatever you want them to learn, but uh, do you think that there are a lot of different um, ways to achieve that particular yeah. learning uh, something? Maybe it's just transferring your knowledge, but maybe other ways, there are other methods to achieve that particular <laughs> Sure. Thank you. I mean, that's helpful. That's differentiating the ends and the means, isn't it? The point is to help students learn something, which is different from giving uh, and actually related to exchanging experiences. So we've got some of this is process and some of this is the end point, as it were. Yeah, thank you. You were going to say, nice and loudly, if you would. Right. Empowering students through the development of skills and, and, yeah. and knowledge. And knowledge. <laughs> yeah. That which is interesting. Again, we're moving on from knowledge to skills and knowledge. This all from half a dozen examples. We, we're gradually getting lots of different nuances in. Anything different from that? Right, okay, so things you're going to do to enable learning, yeah. The word enabling coming back in again, right. Okay, that's, so that's interesting. You've got, you've, got, you've got a mix, haven't you? Some of it is about the teaching act, of, and some of it is about to enable learning, and some of it, in, in, there are assumptions about how that takes place, that you can transfer it, you can give it, or you share experiences or whatever. From this group, there's a variety of views, I would suggest, um, or assumptions about what teaching actually is. None of them right or wrong, but all of them actually, obviously, current and in the world. Let's take research. Can we have a go at defining research? Anybody care to pitch in with that one? What is research? Please do. I would say propose questions, answer questions, and discover knowledge. Propose questions, answer questions, and... And discover knowledge, yeah. I think the proposed questions is particularly an interesting one, which I'll come back to in a minute. Proposed questions, answer questions, uh, and discover knowledge. Any, any advance on that or changes? Please do. Research is like digging into the unknown to add to the pile of what is known. Ah, research is like digging into the unknown to, yeah, uh, to add to the add pile of... Pile of what is known, that's interesting. It's very interesting to move into metaphor, I think, isn't it? Sometimes you almost feel you have to. Yes, that's a, re that's a really interesting one. Digging into the unknown, making the unknown known. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, thank you. That's a really interesting image. S other suggestions, please. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, it's not, it's not starting from a basis of total ignorance, so you have to start from what is known already. That's why I added the pile of what is known. Yes, yes, but thank you. Yeah, the metaphor stands up, that's good, that's excellent, right. Uh, any additions to that? Please, nice and loudly if you would. Maybe it's an extra knowledge you can share with your students because otherwise it would be boring if you all the time tell about the same thing. Find something new to share with your students. And okay, so research is about finding something new that you can then share. Yeah. 
it, it's, there's a communicative act going on there as well as actually... So you don't just put it on the pile, you then direct people to look at this pile. And I don't know what they're going to do with the pile, but they're going to interact with it in some way. Um, OK, thank you. Anything different from that? Could you do that louder? I'm sorry. To discover new pedagogies. Methodologies. 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 Sorry, methodologies. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's not just what we know, but how we come to know what we know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Thank you. That is very, that's very helpful. Now, we could go on for a long time, but I've got other exciting questions to ask you. Um, so I'm going to move on. Um, uh, uh, the, the point I would want to make there is, I mean, clearly uh, we've got different emphases on what teaching is and if, uh, probably a fairly unified sense of what research is if you take all of that together. There's not too many tensions in that. What's interesting is when you try to put those two things together. And um, let me just move us on to an, a framework I think is quite interesting to look at this and to problematize it further. This is not new by any means. This is Ernest Boyer, again, who in the late 1980s, I think, um, I think this is published later than he'd be talking about it, um, proposed that we shouldn't just be thinking about research and teaching because research is much broader than is often thought and teaching is much broader than is often thought and that it'd be better to think in terms of a group of related scholarships. Um, now, if we take the research side, uh, quite often when people think about research, they think about basic research or pure research, you know, quite theoretical research that may not have uh, an actual application yet or ever in the real world. And his suggestion is that there's a whole range of scholarships. At the top end, well, by top, it just happens to be at the top of the page. It doesn't mean it's the best or anything. Um, there is discovery learning, which is basic learning, basic research, pure research, genuinely discovering something that is absolutely new and totally gener and, and is generalizable, if you like. Um, and that there are two other kinds of research. Um, one is integration, putting together things that are already known into other forms. And a third one, which is application, making a difference to something in the real world by bringing your research to bear on it. And once you've got that there, then teaching can also spread out because teaching may not be teaching of people in a university in this kind of setting. It may well be consultancy. It may well be working with companies, with people, groups outside the university to... Um, improve the way that they, they do things. So teaching may be a much more consulta consultative basis and it may be out in communities and so on. And so the point he's making there, I think, is that when you start to say, well, how is research related to teaching? Actually, there's all sorts of different kinds of research going on, as we actually know in the university. And there's different kinds of teaching going on, from really standard undergraduate teaching through to very applied stuff out, out in the world. Uh, but when we talk about this issue of research and teaching, we tend to go to the two extremes and then say, oh, they're different, aren't they? They're, they're not related at all. Well, they clearly are related in some way. You can relate them through this continuum. And his notion is that these are for all forms of scholarship. What do we mean by scholarship? You don't even have a minute to think about that one. Well, what is scholarship? Word we use all the time. Scholarship, scholarly communities, what is scholarship? It's not a trick question, it's very straightforward. As such, it's the, such it's the community, it's the educational community and at the university level. It's the, it's the educational community, yes. I, I, you're absolutely right, it has a social component. But, but what is scholarship? If somebody is scholarly, what does that mean? They do the job properly. What does properly mean? Yeah, yeah. I, they know how to do this kind of thing. Do this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if somebody is being scholarly, yeah, thank you. That gets us a long way. What, what do we mean by somebody who's scholarly or somebody who's unscholarly? It's 
if you saw a criticism in an in a, in a academic journal saying this is a very poor piece of scholarship, what would that, what would that be? Poorly informed. Poorly informed. And I said before, upon the basis of what you know, that yeah. a scholar, someone who is a scholar list may have looked for uh, existing information. Yes. 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 But having a lot of knowledge about what is good or better. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, it's disciplined inquiry, isn't it? It's, it's knowing what, working from what is known, and the word methodology comes in as well, and setting about it in an organized way that you could defend. It's careful work that builds on what's known, takes the best of what's known, uh, and is conscious of the assumptions it's making and the rules that it is using in order to advance the um, knowledge. Even in terms of scholarship, it may only be the individual's knowledge. It doesn't mean new knowledge for the world necessarily. So the point that he's making, I guess, which what underlies these, is whatever you're doing, there's a concern, a respect for truth, an awareness that you need to know what went before, an awareness that you need to know a good and defensible way of working with that knowledge to find more knowledge. And when you start thinking about that, it's very hard to see any difference at all, I would suggest, between research and teaching in terms of approaches. And yet, uh, you could argue that research and teaching are set up in universities as if they were two completely different activities, as I will try to show. I think. Yes, okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to get into more detail about research and teaching in a minute, but I want um, to just offer you an image here initially and see what we can get out of this one. Um, because what I want to look at is the context for universities, really, for a, for a bit, to see if, if our job is changing. This is a medieval university um, uh, image taken straight from, from the web. Um, so let's assume that's probably about 1,300 or something of that nature. And um, what I quite like to do is juxtapose it with a modern teaching situation, which is that. Well, plus ça change, as the uh, French might say. It looks uncannily similar, doesn't it? You could come into this lecture room from 1300 or 1400 and you'd know what this is about, really. You wouldn't think, oh, what are these people doing? You'd say, oh, it's a lecture room. Um, <laughs> it's the same. Okay. So the question to you is, what's different and what's the same? Is, has this not changed or has it radically changed both within that space and outside that space, if you compared 1400 with today, what are the significant changes as far as teaching is concerned? Put, take a second to think about that, because that's quite a hard question, I think, really. Please do, and again, nice and loud. Technology. Technology, Technology yes. To yeah. Very easy to that. Yes. It, yes, so, certainly, and we'll come to technology in more detail in a bit. I'm always been impressed they've all got books, actually. I think that's pretty good for 1,400, for them all to have books. Um, yeah, so the technology has changed, and we'll come to what impact that has in a bit. Please do. Yes. but they're still sitting listening to this one person here. Yeah, but the method may be changed how you deliver the lecture and how you interact with the, yeah. the, the audience. Yes. Yes. So there's a lot we don't... Yeah. There's a lot we don't know by just looking at the still image. We don't know what's happening. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Please, nice and loud again. Uh, you know how 
Yes. It, that's it. That is very interesting, because obviously we're not totally free to teach anything that we want within certain ethical constraints, but you're quite, you're quite right. And it's interesting, there is an ecclesiastical, there's a church look to this, isn't there? The, the, where there is, one presumes, uh, a, a more careful uh, um, selection of the kinds of knowledge that are acceptable to be taught. We have a much more broad sense of knowledge and learning, perhaps, and of what is acceptable and worth learning and appropriate to learn perhaps, than what than used to be the case. Anything else? Please, yes. The only thing we can see now is that there are women in this type of system. Mm. There are no women there. Mm. Probably there are, there are more heterogeneous yeah. in this picture than in the one from uh, the medieval times. Yes, it is a little bit male-dominated, isn't it? I think, yeah, I think it's fair to say. Thank you. Well, well spotted, yes. Anything else? Yes. Thank you. I think that's really helpful, I think. Yes, one sense is that the principal relationship in the top one is with the printed word on the page there, which by the, fa the fact that how long it took to produce a book then would not be revised very, very frequently, um, whereas now we're looking at something much broader than that. There was another comment from somewhere. There was a hand. Some, no, have we done that? Yes, please do. Mm. I, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, yes, if you hadn't said that, oh, I would notice just the, the sheer size of the person speaking. They've chosen a giant, yeah. metaphorically a giant to speak, who's bigger than the others and has that authority that, that, and that's and that signaled by the picture. Yeah, so I, I think this is quite, you know, it is really interesting because at first sight you can get a little laugh by saying, well, it's totally the same, isn't it? But actually it's different in many ways but those ways are not actually obvious. Um, one of the problems, though, I suspect, is that some things haven't changed that ought to change. Um, and, and an argument I would make is that... I mean, I mean, I would argue for lectures in some limited circumstances. They can be very useful for teaching, but if they're what most people do most of the time, they're probably not helpful, and yet... It, is, it remains the dominant way of teaching in many universities across the world. And the cost of teaching, you know, lecturing is cheap. It's the cheapest way of teaching everybody. Cram 500 in a lecture theatre with one member of academic staff. You cannot think of a cheaper way of doing it, really. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not necessarily leading to effective learning, which is presumably the yardstick that we should judge teaching by. OK, so let me just... Um, flesh out some of the things that we touched on just now. The difference in the world that universities are in, and you know this. You know this because it's your daily experience and you see it on the news just as I do. We know that universities, unlike the 14th century, are now mass institutions. I think in Spain, 41%, I heard yesterday, of the uh, of the uh, population uh, of a particular range, range go to university in the UK. It's around that. It's 45 or something of that nature. Some parts of the world, it's 60, 70, even 80 percent of the population go to some form of higher education. That's a radically different thing because obviously it, it expands the base of the kinds of people who are in universities and the kinds of people who teach them and the kinds of things that are being taught. It's a very different world than it was. When I went to university, I mean, you, you realise I'm incredibly ancient, um, that only 5% of the UK population went to university, and I went in 1973. 5% went, and now it's 45%. Even in half a lifetime, 
it's absolutely changed really significantly. And education has now become a market commodity in ways that it wasn't before. We hear of students being referred to as consumers. In what way somebody who is constructing themselves in a university, how they can be a consumer, I don't know. Um, but that's, that's, that's the metaphor that is increasingly used of education as being something that's consumed. And we have globalization and communication technologies. Well, I'm not going to... Um, that's a huge topic in its own right, but let me flip to this. Um, oh, just a little question, by the way. Well, where is this um, left-hand picture? Can anybody identify where it is? Oh, oh, are there any contextual clues that would make you think where it might be? Is it a guess? No. It's interesting that it's hard to tell, isn't it? Um, that is actually China. That's Ningbo, which is Nottingham University, UK University's campus in China. Built to look like Nottingham University in the UK. Raises all sorts of interesting questions. Um, it depends where the staff come from as well and when the students come from. Whose culture is this here? What is being taught here? But what it really reinforces is just how international, just how global the world has um, become. Um, so we now sort of take that for, grant, for granted. But it, it just raises interesting questions about, OK, in a world like that, what kind of skills and capabilities and attitudes are needed in a global globalized world. And the other really significant thing, which I've depicted there with the image of the network, is you could argue that universities almost had the monopoly on certain kinds of knowledge. Um, most of the research used to be done in universities. Uh, universities had a strong role in validating knowledge, what is good knowledge and what is less valuable knowledge. Um, and universities, of course, exist to pass on knowledge. There's very much this strength, strong tradition of uh, uh, transmitting knowledge. All of that's up for grabs now. So many outside organizations do research. Universities are only part of the game, really. Um, so much knowledge is in the world, and it doesn't get near universities. It is so easy for people to co uh, cooperate with one another, to communicate with one another, the university is not in the position of sitting there doling out knowledge anymore. And it raises the question of what is a university for then? What is it trying to do, especially in this world where we can't predict what the future is going to look like? OK, so let me address this question. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Um, question to you now. Here are a number of uh, proposals as to what a university is for. Um, I, 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 I'd, I'd like to use democracy at this point and just ask you, this is a daft question because the answer will be more than one, but to choose one of those that you think is the most important thing that a university should focus on. Just take a few seconds to decide which you would vote for. Shall we just see if we all agree on this one? If, if when you look at that list you think the main purpose of the university is to strengthen the national economy, would you just raise your hand? Nobody thinks that, which is interesting because if you ask government, certainly in the UK, what it was for, they would all put their hands up at that point. So there's a little bit of attention, isn't there? Safeguard all that is best in cultural life. <coughs> yes, it's, yes, it's a dreadful way of doing this, isn't it? But only one. Otherwise, it gets complicated for me. Um, so nobody's, no, there are no high culture people here, that, which is interesting in itself. Distribute educational opportunity fairly. 
to two. Right, two or three, yes. Uh, reproduce the academy. Make sure there are more academics to keep us going. It's quite important because who's going to supply the heap of knowledge if we can't reproduce ourselves, in a sense? There are many countries where it's very difficult to get academics to do work uh, because uh, there's just not enough money in their system to do it. So that's not important. Then. Conduct pure research that has no commercial value to... To people. Can I ask, um, are you a researcher by any chance? Yes. Yes, I thought you might be. Uh, <laughs> that's a bit unfair. Uh, and you're an active researcher as well? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Critique aspects of society. I'm beginning to wonder what you think they're for. Um, make knowledge freely available to all. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, that is interesting. Thank you very much. So that's about 20, I, sh I should have thought. Be useful. Uh, seven or eight. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Is it? It's very hard, isn't it? Because you might think both of those things. But be useful really is quite an interesting one, and that's a real tension in universities at the moment. We are moving far more into a never mind. It's interesting. Is what use is it? I mean, that's a question that's being asked again and again now in universities. Not knowledge for the sake of it, but for a use. The difficulty is we can't predict what the uses are, and yet we're told we must be more and more useful. Okay, encourage international understanding. Boy, oh boy, do we need that. Okay, about half a dozen there. And contributing to the local community. Okay, five or six. Okay, oh, that's interesting. I think, I think the, uh, the one, which one, the, the distributed educational opportunity? No, no, it was make knowledge freely available to all was the one that, was, uh, that was, got the most, I think. And the... the What's the purpose of looking at that? The purpose of looking at that, I think, is, is, to, is to illustrate the tensions that there are in universities uh, as to what they are for, because we don't all agree here. So clearly, why would there be broad agreement in the world? And therefore, it's all the more important to be thinking about research and teaching and how they interrelate in terms of what's the overall purpose of where we're trying to get to. You know, it's all very well having a neat little session that says, you know, how do you link research and teaching together? But that begs the question, well, what for? What's the purpose of education? Because unless you're clear about that, then there's no point, really, in thinking about how you link this with that, because you don't know where you're trying to get to. OK, so let's have a look at that one. Um, what is a graduate? I, I, I've, I, I've thought about half a dozen of the most horrible questions, and I put them in a presentation. What is a graduate? Uh, we presumably all know we're in an institution that produces graduates. Presumably, we can all come up with a definition of a graduate. Anybody like to suggest that? You're not allowed to say someone who has a degree. Okay? <laughs> Although, interestingly, um, there used to be a handbook when I first started in higher education because I had to design a course and I wanted to know what the difference was between a certificate, a diploma, and a degree. And I looked in the most authoritative source, and it said a diploma is higher than a certificate, but lower than a degree. And I took that knowledge, and it didn't do me any good at all. I was no further forward. What is a graduate? A person who is an expert in a certain area. Okay. Expert in a certain area. Yeah. Okay. So it's got to have subject content somewhere in it. Yeah. Okay. An expert in a certain area. Any advance on that? Yeah. So essentially a graduate is whatever the university says it is. Yeah. But, but, well, it, in a sense it is, isn't it? I mean, in the UK you will have a different system here. You know, a, an old university had a charter which gave it the right to award a degree. And that's what a university is, if you like. It awards its own degrees, which effectively says exactly that. If the university says it's a degree, it's a degree. Okay. What else? Anything else? If you were employing a graduate as opposed to a non-graduate, they say you're an employer, what would you expect to get walking through the door? Somebody taller or what? <laughs> what how would they be different other than subject content? Uh, okay. 
more experienced? Uh, yeah, in, in learning, uh, probably in teaching also. More experienced in learning? And teaching. And, and teaching, yeah, okay. They should be more experienced at, well, maybe, um, that they would understand, would that they would have more experience of learning or that they would be better at learning or both? Depends. Yes. Yes. Okay. Any, anything else? The graduate walks through the door. What are you expecting? This is, this is the product. For heaven's sake, this is, this, is a, this is a machine that produces graduates. So what is the product? Flexible and hardworking. Yeah. Open to learning. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's, that's, that's getting into the skills vocabulary now, isn't it? Of the things that we would expect of graduates. Thank you. I mean, it's a really, really difficult, and, but quite an obvious question, really. Um, here are two... Uh, oh, that's, we don't need that. Um, what is a graduate? Two... UK universities tried to grapple with the question of what is a graduate and they came up with these two. This is Queen Mary University of London in the East End of London which came up with that list and Glasgow that came up with that list. Um, and they're all inventing the, reinventing the wheel, aren't they? There's a sense of a kind of intellectual flexibility an ability, an ability to deal with the world in an intelligent and capable way that you would expect would be developed through an undergraduate degree. Um, really interesting, though. I mean, how does somebody doing a law degree, what kind of capabilities do they get? Is it the same as an engineer would get? The same as somebody from theatre studies would get? Really quite interesting questions, I think. Um, so... That, you could argue, I mean, I think it's perfectly fair, we are, we are trying to achieve something like that. That's the kind of onward movement that we're trying to get. And so the basic question is, well, how are we going to produce people, um, forgive me using the word produce, it's a terribly mechanistic metaphor, but you know what I mean. Um, um, how are we going to encourage the emergence of people who have those broad attributes and capabilities? And this is where the research and teaching link comes in, of course. We're trying to achieve this. How can research help us to do this? And I would venture to suggest it doesn't come about just because somebody does a bit of research and then tells it to a student. That is not a very well developed sense of what the relationship between research and teaching is. But it's the one most people think of immediately. If you say, how is research linked with teaching? Oh, I learned X in my research and I put it into this master's module or something. It would be the common answer. But it's not much of an answer because it doesn't really get at this skills issue. It doesn't get at this, this real question about how you develop people's broad attributes and capabilities. Okay, right. Now... Um, one other point I'd like to make in terms of what we're trying to do is this, and I, I, I commend this to you. It's, the, it's about the oldest thing I know of in, in modern educational literature, which is, and it doesn't sound very interesting, does it? Bloom's Taxonomy of Educational Objectives. But essentially, Benjamin Bloom in 1956 suggested that what we're trying to do in education is enable people to work as high up that list as possible. So if we start at the bottom simply knowing something's true, move up a bit, comprehending it, understanding it in some depth, being able to apply it, being able to analyse with it, being able to make new knowledge, synthesis, and the top evaluation, can you stand outside of a whole system and see it for what it is as a system of beliefs and values or, uh, or whatever, and you can uh, critique it from there, its strengths and weaknesses. So that's his argument, and, quite a, I th and I think it's really powerful. I come back to that again and again. You know, if you're really trying to get people more educated, if you like, more capable, then you want people working at the top end of that and not at the bottom end of that. It's a simple and obvious but incredibly useful uh, listing. Coming back to the lecture... 
if the lecture does nothing but transmit facts, then it is at the level of knowledge, isn't it? The lecturer may try to go into some detail and explain it a little, then it's at level of comprehension. Um, it's only when the lecturer starts asking questions, which I've been trying to do now, and say, OK, so what do you think and what does that mean and what underlies that, that you move into application and analysis. And we're nowhere near synthesis or evaluation. So, so by running the lecture like this, you can move into application and analysis. You can get it up there little way. But, of course, if you want to get to those other levels, then it's a matter of people going out, doing assignments, discussing quite focused things and so on. You can't do it within a lecture, I would venture to suggest. Okay. So I, I think that's a very useful... Uh, I, I, my apologies that it's so old, but I think it's very, very valuable as a list. It continues to be useful. It doesn't, incidentally... Quite often people say, yeah, well, that's what learning is about. It's going up there. But what's missed out? of that list. Motivation. Sorry? Motivation. Motivation. That's the next topic. But um, yeah, well it is. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's a part of what's missed out. Yeah. Communication. Communication. Yes. Yes. That's right. Yeah. When you know little, and you think you know a lot. Yeah. So it's the case, you know a lot, but you think you know little. Yeah. And the fourth one, she says, you know a lot, and you are aware that you know a lot, which you also yes. know about it. So I, it's a way of summarizing everything that comes up in your life. Yes, I think you're right. It, it has relatively little to say about learning to learn, as it were, and awareness of learning. The, the other absence, if I may suggest, is, is the emotional side of learning. This is a, a cognitive model and it's very often taken as being what universities are about. It's, uh, of, uh, it's, uh, for some reason this has become the dominant paradigm for what universities are for and it forces us very strongly in a cognitive path when actually there are many affective things to do with emotions and values and so on which are equally important but they tend to get neglected. Anyway, Okay, so let me just ask you one more um, question, um, which is about your own learning as, as we move into the relationship between research and teaching. Um, now, one thing you are all experienced in is learning. You are here. You are successes in the world of learning. And my question to you is, can you think of a time that you would be prepared to share with other people um, when you learnt something really effectively, and the question beyond that is, well, what aspect of the learning situation really worked for you and meant that you really learnt it? Take a few seconds to just cast your mind back about all the learning experience. They may not be academic ones, necessarily. Um, and what, when did you learn something most effectively, and what, where was the effectiveness based? Take a second. Now, um, we, sadly, we haven't got time for the long story. Um, so what I want to cut to is the, what was the significant thing? What was the aspect of the situation that meant you learnt it most effectively? Anybody care to give us something without revealing their innermost secrets? Please do, nice and loudly, if you would. Yes. Who set the clear goal? Uh, you did? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
All right. Okay. Additions to that, please. Simply repetition to get better at doing it. But there's nothing. Uh, this is how to write. A oh, typewriting. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Yes. Because my, I had, <laughs> I'd hoped you'd said writing, because what you then have to ask about is, well, where did, did you get feedback to get better? And I guess in typewriting, well, you do get feedback. In fact, it doesn't look very nice. Then you know you've got to do it differently. But, uh, yeah, okay. And you were going to say, yeah. Right. So right. And, and, and you were learning signs. Sign language. Sign language. Yes. Yes. That's right. It's very interesting. In, in languages in general, there's an awful lot of, present, uh, of, of repetition in, in, in the pedagogy of, 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 of language and the expectation that you've got to go over and over and over in order to learn. Anything else? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yes. It's thrown in at the deep end, is the. Yeah. Yeah. So if you wanted to succeed, you had to do this thing. Yes. Yeah. That's an interesting example. Thank you. Any, any, anything else? Any other conditions? On... Yes. Again, loudly. Thank you. That, which ties in with what you were saying. It's your goal. You'd set a goal, and then there's a purpose for learning. Okay, let me move on. Unless anyone's got anything totally different from that? Okay. Let me, let me move on then to, to suggest. What I want to suggest is, I think as far as teaching is concerned in universities, for very good reasons, we're going down exactly the wrong path. Um, and one of the reasons is we're more and more concerned that students should succeed, and that's absolutely fine. We're more concerned that we should know what it is that they have learnt, therefore. And the problem with all of that is that you end up turning a university into a fact factory, almost, rather than being a place where genuine learning occurs. And let me just try to illustrate what I mean by that. Here is a challenge from the late 60s, early 70s. I used this one yesterday. Carl Rogers, who wrote from a humanistic psychology perspective, and he made this claim. I'll give you a few seconds just to digest that. Right, so the end point is, if you do things very badly in, in education, meaningful learning will be at an absolute minimum. Now that immediately opens up the question of what meaningful learning means. Um, and I think what he means is that it's got personal meaning to the individual, that they have some investment in that process of learning and they think there will be value in having learnt something. It means a little bit more than that, I think, but, but, but certainly that. Now, then compare your experience of university with this list, um, a prescribed curriculum. Is it the fact that the curriculum was set out before you turned up? It was a curriculum that you had to fit into. Similar assignments for all students. Did you find yourself doing the same assignment as somebody else? Lecturing as almost the only mode of instruction. Well, obvious. Standard tests by which all students are externally, it says evaluated, that's the US meaning of evaluated, they mean assessed in, 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 in UK terminology. Um, and did the 
instructor, which is a U US term, of course, that did the teacher choose grades as the measure of learning. Now, I suggest that most of our experiences would be uh, yes to all of those. That's the dominant model. And you can see the problem we've got is that we are keeping responsibility to ourselves because we're concerned about standards and we're being observed for our standards and so on. It's very difficult to let go. Um, we feel we've got to define more and more. One of the major things in the U UK at the moment is differential attainment, the, the worry that a group of students have an experience, they go through a program, and some of them do better than others. Gosh, that's a problem. We've really got to sort that out. How do we sort out? Well, we've got to be even clearer about what we're teaching, and we've got to make sure that we assess very, very carefully to make sure that everybody has a full chance to achieve. You can see how the world closes in as we specify more and more to help the student. We specify more and more. We take the job of deciding what's to be learnt, uh, deciding how it's going to be organised, deciding how it's going to be assessed, and so on. And you can see that in the world. I think this will come up in bits. Let me just put all of these on the, on the screen. This is the standard way, uh, pretty well across the world now, in which we think about designing for teaching. That is to say, the first thing we do is we develop the aim and the learning outcomes. So be very clear where it is you want the student to get to at the end of it. Okay? And if I can just say as an aside in that, is that the same as research? Does a research project start from the point where you're absolutely clear what the answer is going to be? And then you do the research project. I would suggest by definition, it's the reverse of that. Otherwise, it isn't research. If you know what the answer is, it isn't research. It's just reproduction of something. So that's interesting that we've got a model of teaching that is diametrically opposite to the model of research. So you develop the aim, then you think of some teaching and learning activities that you think are going to enable people to meet those aims. Uh, and then you get the students to go through uh, the learning materials, the content. Then you assess them, uh, and then you let them know whether they have now got the things that you decided they should get at the beginning. This is called constructive alignment. The, uh, the guru of constructive alignment is John Biggs, and it's become the standard way in which we design curricula. For good reasons. Because can you imagine a university that was totally vague about what it was trying to teach and didn't really help students to learn? Um, there's, a, there's a lovely little uh, quote, a piece of feedback, I'm not sure if it's really true, from a student who was asked, uh, was this a good course? And, and the student said, yes, this was a very comprehensive course. Everything that wasn't covered in the lectures was covered in the examination. <laughs> right? So that's the problem we've got to guard against. I'm not speaking against this altogether, except along with it, comes the danger of over-proceduralizing everything and over-specifying it. And where has the choice gone in that? That's the dominant model for good reasons, but it, it removes choice and so on. So that's not too good. And we've got, um, probably, this is probably over-egging it. You probably don't need that. But this is the language of constructive alignment. This is straight from um, John Biggs and Centrally in that, on the right, the key point, everything is known. Just like the research world, I know and you don't, and I am going to transmit it to you. And that's just not where we need to be in higher education, I would suggest. We've got to get some openness back into higher education. Here is my last exhibit that uh, it tries to explain what is, what is uh, wrong with where we are in how a lot of teaching goes on. In the UK, there is a national student survey that is given to all students when they finish their undergraduate degree. And it, it, the figures are then published, and that produces league tables for universities of how well they've done. It's a really powerful lever on universities. It's the thing that universities probably take the most notice of. The questions that students are asked 
to answer have to do with this? Now, if you look at that and think, think of an exam factory where things are provided for students and they just learn stuff and do stuff and do the assessment and get out, think of something which is really intellectually stimulating where you have to think for yourself, you have to bring a lot to the whole, uh, to the whole enterprise and so on. I would have said it's fairly obvious that with the exception of a little bit down the left-hand side, most of this is about customer satisfaction. Was the library always open? Did I like the sandwiches at lunchtime? <laughs> Was everything given to me to make me happy and comfortable? You know, who said learning had to be happy and comfortable? I mean, quite often it's not. It's not. Part of learning is being uncomfortable, that you don't know something. It's a process of going through to knowing something. So there's a problem. You know, that for very good reasons, we want to know that students are satisfied. But once again, we're taking responsibility away from the student, uh, which is where, where you would want it to be. You want people to have some choice in what they've done, to have an investment in it to really feel they've got some control over it. And also, why wouldn't we ask students to assess themselves to some extent? Here's a very simple suggestion. Every assignment that is handed in in a university could have a top sheet where the student then looks at the assessment criteria and assesses their work against the assessment criteria before a member of academic staff looks at it. It's very unusual for that to happen in universities. Why not? Why wouldn't we require our students to think about the quality of their own work and to give their own view? Not that they, are, they, they would have the final say, but it would give them that exercise. It's putting people, giving people charge of things, getting them to evaluate the quality of their own work, just as you do in research. When you're doing research, the principal person you're concerned about satisfying, other than the person paying you the money, that that, you know, you have to convince them to get the money, but in the end, you're trying to satisfy yourself. You're trying to do something that is satisfactory as a piece of research. So, and, and you have to judge the quality of your research as you go along. So why would teaching be any different? You want people to have the responsibility to, to make judgments of their own. Okay. Um, and this leads us to the problem of student disengagement. Um, this is from a report that was done several years ago about, about student engagement in higher education. And this is a, you know, a, really, a real issue in a current term. Um, what a lot of faculty say is, you know, I put effort into marking and they don't look at what I write. Uh, they don't even bother to come and pick up their assignment. So why am I bothering to give them feedback and so on? There's that extent of disengagement in universities of students thinking, well, I've done my assignment, that's it. Just tell me what the mark is and that's it. That's the nature of the contract. It's surely, surely we want people to be more involved in it than that, to, to borrow some of the way in which people approach research and to apply it to teaching. Um, and the second point, I think, is an interesting point that if research and teaching are both about learning, where is the space in universities where we talk about learning? It's the main thing we do, but when in your experience as an undergraduate or a postgraduate, do you get to sit and talk about, okay, why did I find that difficult to learn? How could I have made it easier for me to learn? You know, that happens sometimes, and there are study skills options and so on. But by and large, that whole issue of how am I learning and am I learning effectively doesn't really get asked. And yet it's absolutely central, I would argue. Now, I've got a question, I think, uh, because I want to, keeping on the time again, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll move on from there. The role of research then, okay. Um, just interested to see what your experience has been. You know, it's an interesting cross-section of people from, from this community. What role did research play in your undergraduate experience? So let's take a second to think about it and try and think about research quite broadly. Was your undergraduate experience quite research-related, researchy, research-informed? Was it not? I don't have an investment in that. I'm just interested to know what your experience was. Anyone? 
anybody care to pitch in? Does that conjure up any ideas? Please, again, nice and loud. Yes, okay, so a certain amount of teamwork happening, yeah, yeah, which is, which is in, that, very interesting, isn't it, because so often education is seen as a solo activity, as it were, and life isn't like that, yeah. Can, can you say that again a bit louder? I'm struggling with that. Yeah. Okay, being introduced to research skills, essentially. Yeah, the vocabulary of research. Yes, thank you. Other, yes. And that was many years ago. Um, I, the only time I can think that research came into play in my undergraduate studies was when I was told you have to do a paper on this topic. Yeah. So I would just go into the library and look through files, but not computer files. Yeah. And then look at the shelves and start picking up books and trying to find which ones were useful. Computers and no yeah. access to databases or reliable yes. uh, social research was me choosing books yes. and then choosing within the books yes. what would be useful to answer a given question. Yes, thank you. That's interesting. And what ra that raises with me is the the more complicated issue we have today is it what constitutes a legitimate source, as it were. Life was simpler in the yes. days that you're talking about and, and that I recall. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank, that is very interesting what the outcome of that was. Yeah. Right. Okay, other comments? Yes, please do. Yes. And, and also the critical thinking, because um, not only what you research, but the way you communicate and you present the knowledge in a critical way. Yeah. So I think research is very useful. Yes. I think I'm absolutely right. One of the major th things that you're trying to get across, it seems to me, undergraduates in any discipline, is criticality and having some critical engagement, not simply taking something as it is, but looking at evidence and so on. And that is something that can much more readily be got at in a world of research where all knowledge is, has been found and is, 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 you know, has to be justified, is up for question and so on, rather than it's in a textbook, here it is, learn it. It's a different relationship with knowledge. Any, anything else? Again, very loudly, if you would. Yes. Go.
Yes. Yes, that's interesting. People very often say that the best way of learning something is trying to teach it, yes. I think that's right. But I think you raise an interesting question about it. You, you, you spent a lot of time not, not having support and having to work things out for yourself. And that's an interesting pedagogical problem. At what point do you step in and offer help and structure, and at what point do you stop because it's just becoming that you're doing all the work, actually, for the student? And that's a very difficult judgment to make. I mean, my rule of thumb is you give students as much independence and autonomy as they are able to cope with at the time and actually push a little bit. That's where you want to be, to be continually encouraging people to be more autonomous and less dependent. But that doesn't mean just abandoning them. That's, that's a different, that's a rather old-fashioned but sadly very commonplace way of viewing um, uh, university work. Okay, let me just Conscious of the time, I won't uh, detain you for too much longer because this is a warm room. Let me um, just try to bring this together a little bit by saying, well, what, what, you know, what are some of the benefits of being res bringing research processes mainly um, to, together uh, with student learning? And these are, these are the prizes, I think. I mean, and this is summarising some of what we've talked about. There is a motivational aspect, I think. One of the things that... I think there's an awful lot of basic human nature that we, 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 we forget in, in life because we've become so technical. I was talking with Manel about this yesterday, the power of story. It's one of those things that we forget. But actually, stories are, are wonderful things. Um, but actually, hearing from somebody who really cares about something, who's really interested in it, is a powerful motivator, actually. And we sort of forget it because we think we can be dry and technicist about it and that the facts will speak for themselves. They don't. The reason I'm here now is, I hope, it's more engaging than you just having a book about it because I'm bringing my enthusiasm, I hope that you could see that, for this. And that's part of the value of having a session such as this one. So having people who are really invested in something is an important benefit, potentially, provided they're able to explain the nature of their investment to the people in front of them, which is another matter. Then active learning that we've, we've touched on at various times. Setting your goals and then actually doing the stuff yourself rather than having it done for you. We so often take all the hard bits out and do it for ourselves and then give the students relatively straightforward things to do because we've taken all the chance out of things. And the possibilities for skills development. Of course, doing research means a whole set of skills have to be developed in relation to knowledge, in relation to other people and working with other people. And so that provides the opportunities that quite often aren't there if somebody's just sitting in a lecture, passively listening. And so, on. so the, the prize is there. You know, there's a lot that we can get um, that we don't necessarily. Now, I think I've just got time to ask. This is quite hard, actually. I'll be, I don't know. Yeah, let's, let's see how we go. Because I had, um, I, had, I had that experience for some years of trying to persuade people in departments to think about how they could become more research-like in their, in their teaching and so on. And they always came up with a set of reasons why you can't. Uh, this is the set of reasons. Okay. And my challenge to you is if we had more time, I'd set this out as an exercise that would take a little while. If somebody said to you, and if you were in my position, you were saying, could you make your uh, teaching a little bit more engaging, a bit more research-like, and so on, and they said that, what would be your response to that, a polite response to that? <laughs> okay. What would the counter be? Because you've got to find solutions to this. Because it's all very well me saying, be more research-like. It produces teaching problems, if you like, that have to be solved. What's the solution that these people, and they may be different solutions, obviously they're different comments, what would be your response to some of these, your advice? Yes. Yes. So, if there are no lectures, then you have to leave because the professor is not going to tell you anything about it. So, or just, let's say, 
Yeah. So you can bring the, the subject, um, specific knowledge that you want them to learn to the project, and then they would also get that knowledge, but linked to the project that you, that the professor has. Sure. Thank you. Really good start. Thank you. Other, other ad additions to that? Or different approaches? Loud, if you would, because that. Yeah, I had different experience during uh, one seminar. Um, so the lecture was divided into two parts. And first part, uh, the professor was presenting, was delivering the lecture. And the second part, students um, had to had to make a presentation over of an article, but. Um, there was much material that they did not know, and it was unclear. And um, for me, it uh, did not work because I did not uh, learn much, and it was kind of a wasting of time because uh, students could not explain everything in a good way, and some of them they were not really experienced in presentations. So from this kind of activity, uh, I did not learn. Uh, Right, but that's interesting because you've thrown it back at me because I was in problem-solving mode and you've just made it more problematic, haven't you? <laughs> um, so, if you were then standing observing that, what would be your advice to the person in charge of that experience to make it a better experience? I don't know, maybe first to organise some, to, I don't know, to find some time to, to teach students how to make presentations before to give them... Yeah. Uh, these articles. Then articles uh, were, were too complicated for this level of students. Yes. And it was with lots of uh, I don't know, statistics and some terminology, so it was too hard. Yes. To yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That, that's really good answers, I think. So excellent. I mean, because part of the problem is sometimes you give people tasks to do and they don't have the skills to do them. Well, who's got the skills? Oh, the researchers got the skills, actually, and they may not even have thought too much about what skills they've got. And this is where you can start getting some beneficial carry-through. And, of course, the lecturer has to think carefully about the level at which they set the problem. Um, and, and that's an, you know, an interesting and worthwhile thing to be doing. Where things often go wrong is somebody saying, well, let's just give you this really difficult thing, when they haven't thought through how people are going to build to that. So, yeah, I think there are, there are ways you can do research like activities that work well, and as you say, sometimes they don't if, peop if it's not done thoughtfully, I think. Any other, any other answers here? Yeah. Uh, maybe they, they will like it. You yes. Know. You assume that nobody in the classroom is going to like it. So yeah. maybe some students will like it and maybe all of them. Yes. Like and for the, uh, if all the assignments are different, it will take you ages to mark them. Um, I would say two different things. Maybe it's not you who has to mark yeah. all the assignments. And the other thing is it depends on your criteria, the criteria yes. you're using for marking. Yes. You may have to think again about how you're marking, you know, and, and about the marking burden. I think you're right. And, of course, the student can self-assess to some extent. That takes some of the burden away. I think that's interesting. The students won't like it. Um, yes, that's, that's the last refuge of the scoundrel, as they say, isn't it, really? And, you know, I don't want to do this because the students would hate it. Um, and, and, of course, uh, sometimes students aren't very comfortable with it because you're asking them to do things. And doing things exposes you to the possibility of failure. Um, the other interesting part, of course, is that um, when people change their teaching techniques, quite often they're not going to be very successful. It's the same as riding a bike. You know, you wouldn't get on a bicycle once, crash into a wall and say, those bicycles are no good. You would train yourself to ride a bicycle and then you could take it somewhere you wanted to go. And the same applies with teaching techniques. If you're asking both teachers and learners to take up different roles, it takes a little while, you know, it takes a bit of working on it and, and you might need a bit of support to do it. But if you never try, 
and you, and you stick with a very dry teacher-led curriculum, you're depriving students of some things really valuable and actually giving yourself a very boring time. Because quite frankly, if I just stood here talking at you for two hours, as opposed to asking questions and so on, not only would you have been even more bored, but I would have been bored as well. So there is a benefit to everybody, I think, about active learning, because it means that the, 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 the teacher is being active and bringing their research abilities into the, into the equation. So I like that exercise because it's focused on solving problems and not making them. Um, okay, I'm just going to finish in about five minutes. If I'm just conscious that, that I've been talking for a long time now. Um, just with two things that are sort of forms of teaching and approaches to teaching that I think lend themselves quite well to people coming at things from a research perspective. One is the notion of the threshold concept which you may or may not have come across. Can you just raise your hand if you have come across the expression threshold concept? No. One. I thought, no, you're just scratching your head, aren't you? Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, okay. So one. Right. The threshold concept then. This is quite an interesting um, notion. What it's essentially saying, and this has been developed over the last 15 years by two uh, very interesting people, Eric Mayer and Ray Land, um, and essentially what they say is if you're working in a, a, a knowledge area, there are always some things that are really difficult to get a hold of. There's conceptual things that until you get it, you can't really proceed. And, now, and we tend to teach as if all knowledge was about the same level of difficulty and you just give some more and some more and some more. But if you really think about it, and as a researcher, you're well-placed to think about it, you can usually think there are some things that people just get stuck on and they can't go any further until they got it. And then once they got it, they move further forward and quite often can't remember what it was not to know that thing before, which is actually why some people find it difficult to teach because they can't see difficulty anymore so long since they found it difficult. Um, uh, now, in my case, I would, I would say, because I teach a lot in the social sciences, getting people to have a sense of what an argument is in, in prose is really difficult. How are you going to engage with text and turn it into a reasoned argument of yours in which there is your own voice? It's really easy to say it, but so hard to get that idea across. You nearly kill yourself trying to get that idea across. My suggestion is that in all disciplines, this, their suggestion is in all disciplines, there are threshold concepts, if you like, and that working out what those are and then thinking well, how can I best enable students to learn that? Um, how can, what processes, what situations can I put them in where they are most likely to learn it uh, may be very effective. And actually thinking back to your own experience of learning it may be quite a good way of getting a key into that. And the other thing I'd like to, and I'm going to swap over that one, is the problem-based learning is an interesting way of turning the curriculum on its head and turning people into researchers from day one. Um, the notion is that instead of giving people lots and lots and lots and lots of information and then setting a problem, you set a problem and then it's obvious that they're going to need some information to solve the problem and you immediately have a reason for trying to solve the problem. Even better if they've chosen their own problem. So, lorry falls in ditch what you're going to need to do to get out of it. There's the problem set for you. Work out what you need to do to, to, to do that. So the notion is that students are much more uh, motivated provided if something's put in a real context. If it matters, a lot of the problem with things we teach in universities is why would it matter if I know this or not? What difference does it make except I'm going to pass an exam? If there's a reason then for learning something, we, le we tend to learn it better. And so the principles of problem-based learning um, lead us to this sort of, of work where you have people working in small groups, problem-based uh, scenarios, uh, a lot of external activity, active learning, self-assessment, peer assessment and so on, um, and continual feedback, which is very important to improve the quality of learning. Clearly, feedback is really important. Um, now, that's hard to do in some cases because you've got to set it up. The, the, the reason a lot of people teach in a very sequential way, of course, is because it's the easiest thing to do. 
you're almost reading from a book. What you've got to do here is think, okay, so what do they need to know? How can I put that into a problem? Can I present them that as a problem? And then I've got to be prepared to guide them to the information that they need. But if you do it that way around, if you flip the curriculum on its head, then you get a much more engaged curriculum. And it's a simple notion, but it's really powerful. Start with a problem. Don't start with a bunch of facts. Start with a problem. And I'm reminded, I'll finish up and say, I was talking to a head of uh, engineering once who said to me, it was in this project that I began telling you about at the beginning, he said the problem that we have is that we spend three years giving people more and more facts because we don't believe they can do anything until they've got lots and lots of facts. The problem is that at the end of the three years, they never want to be anywhere near this subject again because they're absolutely bored stiff. Um, but, and you can kind of see the logic of saying, well, we need a lot of knowledge in order to solve a problem. But if you flip it around, you actually have a very different dynamic and a different relationship with the task in hand. I could go on, but I won't, because you've been very good to follow me all this way. So I'll stop at that point. Um, are there any questions anybody would like to ask, or any additions? Are we there? Please, yes. It's probably implicit, probably somehow someone mentioned it. But what I was thinking is that probably the, the, the problem we have with, with trying to well, innovate in education is that we have been implicitly taught to think. We don't know. Much of us, many of us probably don't know this until we reflect. Mm. But we have been taught that what matters in science and in knowledge in general is the result. Yeah. The procedures doesn't, don't matter. Yeah. And we transmit that into teaching. Yes. So that, in a way, that models the, the whole process. Yeah. And, well, if I understand correctly, well, I, I would like to just check. I don't know if that's the message, but part of what I would get here as a message is in order to change this then we need to reflect a lot as scholars or as beginning yeah. scholars we need to reflect a lot about how we get to or how we how we do research what are mm. the procedures not only the methodology but even how we how do we how do we prepare a paper for example we need to reflect a lot about that and that would be the only way I guess to, to close how then to transform the way we yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely, I think there's a number of really interesting things there. Yes, very often we pick up bad habits from the way we've learnt because we were not necessarily taught in a very thoughtful way, or we may have been. We can also make the assumption that everybody learns the same way. So you design a learning system that suits you. So there's a danger in that. But I think there is so much to be got out of um, thinking about the research process and bringing that into teaching in the sense that I think what students often see about research is like it, they just see the finished articles, if you like, and it looks really rather worrying. This is beautifully written stuff, peer-reviewed and so on, and they never see the doubt, the agony that goes into it, the repeated draftings and so on. So bringing students into your own experience of researching, I think, can be very valuable and revealing that it's by no means a certain a process, you know, it, that, that researchers are in some ways full of the same kinds of uncertainties as undergraduates might be, and are having to convince other people um, of, of the rightness of what they're thinking about. So making research problematic, I think, is quite a valuable thing to do. Thank you. There was one other comment, and then we, we should stop, I think. Were you going to say? Yeah.
Yeah. Mm. It's a hard question. I don't think there's an easy answer to that, that question. I think one has to acknowledge that students, probably more so today than before, and maybe because we've got a huge, a much broader range of people in universities, um, are very, very often don't have much time to study. You know, they may be supporting themselves, for example. They may be supporting their own families and so on. They may be part-time students. There are, there are realistic limitations, but you can't go from there to saying, well, I won't suggest or propose that they do lots of re reading. You can't use that as the reason for taking back responsibility for reading and thinking and so on. You may have to be a bit more structured. You may have to suggest what you think will be the, most, the best readings. You know, if you've only got this time, read that. But you've got to be careful not to take back responsibility, otherwise you fall into the trap that I've been trying to illustrate today. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what but, yeah, exactly. or yes. What I read for this subject would be uh, applied to another subject. Um, yes, and transfer does not happen automatically, does it? We we think in we learn in compartments. We are like in a, mm. uh, isolated subjects, and sometimes we have to read about this and about this and about that. Sometimes we don't see the connection. Yeah. And I absolutely agree, and interdisciplinarity, which is a, is a huge issue that I haven't even touched on here, but yeah, the world has real problems that are, require multiple disciplines to deal with them, and so we, have to, we need to work in that world, and, that, and yet we, are, uh, we spend our time in individual disciplines still, mainly in universities. Um, and so there are learning opportunities lost there. Yes, if I had more time, I'd have gone into that. But thank you. That's helpful to have raised it. Are we there? Right, I'm going to take that opportunity to declare an end to proceedings. Thank you ever so much for participating. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, well, yes, yes, of course. Yeah. Maybe we can share the presentation to you. Mm. Okay? Thank you very much. We hope you enjoy and learn the, the, the lecture today. Thank you very much.